welcome to Drinking with Authors. I am your host, Erica Lance. My co-host today is the always uh, terrifying, because he has chainsaws in the background today, Mark Muncy from Erie Travels. And our guest today is Tom Reed. Welcome, Tom. Thanks so much. It's so wonderful to be with you today. Yes. Also, you look like you're in a cabin. Are you in a cabin somewhere? Uh, yeah, I'm in the staff lodge at the camp that my grandfather founded in 1908 and my father directed and I directed. I'm now sort of phasing out. Uh, they call me the consulting director, although sometimes I think I'm more the insulting director. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm in the staff lodge at two in the afternoon and I've forbidden any of the staff to come in so they don't see me drinking midday. <laughs> I love I think, that. I love that. Okay. I think they already feel I'm I'm the on the slippery slope to depravity, and this would just reinforce their uh, preconceptions. Yes. Well, we we I'd say we don't want to do that, but I don't know. It's kind of my theme. Like, yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I, I often joke that I can really be used as a bad example. Um. So <laughs> let's talk about what we're drinking. I in a cup that was given to me from one of our friends at History Press. It's from the 30th anniversary of Mardi Gras. I'm drinking wow. a screwdriver because I wanted some orange juice and I was like, orange juice vodka sounds refreshing this afternoon. So I'm all about that. That's Mark, true. what boring thing are you drinking? Oh, uh, because I am, uh, as always, on my wonderful meds, I have to drink the Morbid Curiosity. Uh, that would be their Bell Book and Candle flavor, hmm. which is very buttery and daring chai. And I am drinking it in my Scooby Doo mug. So, yeah, uh, cheers. That's I great. appreciate that. Okay, Tom, what have you got for us? Uh, I am drinking uh, OJ, which is a New England IPA brewed by uh, Lone Pine Brewing in Maine. And it's uh, fruit forward and very hoppy. And it's a hazy New England IPA, which is just the kind I like to drink at two in the afternoon. Oh, I like that. That sounds amazing. Okay. So, Tom, for the audience at large, what do you write? Uh I actually came to writing after a career in in scholarship. I taught um, English literature and film at a college in Pennsylvania. I can say the name, I guess, Dickinson College. Um, And so I wrote my first books were all scholarly. Uh, I'm maybe one of the lingering uh, world experts on medieval debate poetry. Uh, I wrote a study of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde as an allegory of alcoholism. But that led to my first book, which is called Seeking Hyde, uh, which is uh, about Stevenson's writing that novel and about the weird consequence of it turning into a play and being blamed for inspiring Jack the Ripper. So that was the first one. The one I've just finished is uh, is uh, about 40-something twins who don't always see eye to eye. Uh, they were competitive from the time they were in the womb, they, they, they reckon. Uh, and they are faced with their mother deciding to stop eating and drinking after she's lost her husband and been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So wow. they have to usher her through that hospice experience. And then they are, in fact, uh, charged by her with taking her ashes and their dad's ashes and sprinkling them at six locations around the world, um, some of which are challengingly public, like uh, St. Peter's Piazza in Rome. Uh, oh, wow. While they're doing it, they have very, very uh, specific directions for the sprinkling, and they also are given letters by their mother to open at every location, and she reveals a lot of uh, kind of curious and dark and unsettling truths about herself. So for them, it's a journey around the globe and also uh, through their mother's psyche and, and uh, the, the world of, of family uh, acceptance and, and uh, trials. So That's very cool. But I have to go back to the Jack the Ripper thing. Because mm. I do. I do. <laughs> Let's go back. Surrey so, Magnetic. Yeah. Yes. I did not know. Maybe I'm just out of it. I didn't know that they blamed the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde book for Jack the Ripper. Well, in, indirectly, because the, the book was so hugely popular, it was turned into a, a play. And when it opened in, in uh, London's West End, um, the Ripper murders happened almost at the same time. And for a while, the guy was playing Jekyll slash Hyde was a uh, prime suspect of Scotland Yard. Um, oh, wow. And then um, eventually the, uh, the production was shut down until they decided that it probably hadn't caused that. But Stevenson was really thrown for a loop by that. He, he'd pretty much written the novel uh, as a kind of warning against, against excesses of behavior and, and to have sort of spent as much time as he did on that and then to be 
suspect that he might in fact have inspired this this insanity was was difficult for him. Uh, and I discovered that when I was writing the scholarly book and I thought, man, there's got to be a novel in Stevenson uh, deciding what to do after he's potentially brought about this cataclysm. So the whole last two thirds of the book is this fanciful uh, kind of almost a, a Sherlock Holmes uh, analog to Stevenson and his friend John Simmons actually uh, identifying the, the murderer. Wow, that's very cool. cool. I know. I know that there's another book out that claims to know now who sure, Jack yeah. Piper is. I mean, there's yeah. one every couple of months. There was one yeah. literally like the week we recorded this. That just yeah, came. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just a, a tirelessly interesting theme. Kind of sad, but but there it is. No, it's true. So what made you, I mean, obviously scholarly, I'm assuming you wrote those other works based on dissertations and stuff was it like yeah. hey i have to write so this is what i'm gonna write <laughs> yeah the first one medieval debate poetry uh and the aesthetics of irresolution is the kind of mouthful of a title that was a dissertation and uh as any young professor does i was trying to get get tenure so i decided to turn it into a book and uh managed to get it published and uh yeah it's a it's a book which suggests that the kind of monolithic Middle Ages and the assumption that we have that that the church was in control of everything and God's unity was at the heart of, of existence um, is kind of contradicted by these debate poems, which which often involve no resolution at all. They're often scurrilous, they're funny, um, and they basically exist, I think, to make the point that you can just have fun with a poem and not worry about revealing God's truth. Uh, so that was that was what I was doing there. And then the Stevenson book. Um, I just had started teaching Jekyll and Hyde and I was fascinated by it. It's chock-a-block with references to alcoholism. Uh, and, and the more I looked at it, the more I realized that it was probably his coming to terms with the way in which uh, drink itself can be a kind of uh, disguise for, for behavior. People do things when they're drunk they would never do in their own person, as it were. And Hyde is a kind yeah. of uh, just a, a drunken avatar of, of uh, of Stevenson and a very good friend named Walter Ferrier who died of alcoholism. Uh, so the whole first part of the book is him kind of exploring the doubleness of humanity that's revealed in drink. Um, and then the novel comes out and it starts this whole kind of tumbling of, of dominoes in London. And that's where he decides he has to become Sherlock Holmes. Oh, wow. So what is, and then you wrote, let's talk about your newest book, mm -hmm. which um, what may, cause that's, that's sort of a deviation, like from, yeah, that's, that's a big hop, skip and a jump away from where you were. Yeah. yeah. Like, so what, what made you go to that? What was the inspiration there? Yeah. Uh, well, there are a number of them. I mean, stylistically, I, I wrote, uh, Seeking Hyde in, in the kind of vernacular of the, the, uh, Victorian era and <laughs> I remember one of my very good friends from high school read it and said, Tom, you should use smaller words. Um, and, and one of my one of my Goodreads reviewers said he thought it read like uh, written by an eight, eight, uh, eighth grader who had gotten a thesaurus and was determined to use every word in it. Um, and I, you know, I, that's BS in my opinion. I, I was liter literally trying to reproduce Stevenson's voice. And I think it's, it's more effective than that critique might lead you to think. But I wanted to write something that was th thoroughly fresh. I wanted to get out of historical novels which are great to write, but but you kind of write in a in a bit of a straitjacket uh, with facts if you want to be true to the to the original period and events and so forth. And I just wanted to, to kind of get free of that. Um, and so, uh, Pocket Full of Posies sounds like it was written in the early twenty uh, first century, which I was definitely going for. And and honestly, my my. Um, mother-in-law is the prototype in in one way of the woman who decides to stop eating and drinking because in fact she um after her husband had died and after she lived a long and wonderful life um just decided that that uh, her body was telling her it was time to move on uh, and so she decided to stop eating and drinking and her loving children my wife and, and uh, her two brothers supported her in that and just before she died she said uh when this is all over, I want you all to take a trip. And so she paid for a, a vacation in uh, uh, Antigua for the whole family, all the generations. 
And as we were on that trip, I got, got the idea, there might be a story there somewhere. Um, and in fact, I decided to write it. But I have to say, my wife has given me strict instructions to say that Cindy, the, <laughs> the main character early on in the novel, who's pretty, pretty wild and woolly, um, she has the same relationship to my to my mother-in-law that um, Janis Joplin has to Julie Andrews. It's a oh, bit of an exaggerated wow. character. There's a vibrator wow. involved that, that you know that just doesn't fit in with my, my <laughs> mother-in-law. Anyway, <laughs> so what is it? Um, you you were teaching and now you're writing. Do you and obviously running a camp and mm -hmm. probably a, innumerable other things. But what is it that you are looking for as being a writer now? Because, you know, I it sounds like you've written two very unique things, you know, as far as the fiction mm -hmm. part of that goes. But and they're very different. So when you look at like getting your audience and stuff, are you writing just because you enjoy it and it's something you want to do? Like, where, where are you at? Because I think, you know, um, it's everybody's writing journey is different. Mm -hmm. So what, it, what is the journey that you see for yourself? Yeah. Um, I, I might be doing different things. I'm not sure I would be, but if I were early in my career, if I were, if I go into the Iowa writers workshop and we're 30 or something like that, I might look at everything differently. Um, I, I feel like writing now for me is a way of keeping going um, one reason I wanted to write the Stevenson book is because it built so much on my career that it, it was a way to keep that alive. Um, but I, I've always loved writing, never really had a chance to spend a lot of time on, on fiction. And, and so it's a way of keeping fit. I walk nine or 10 miles a day too. So maybe writing is kind of my, my mental equivalent of, of walking that distance. Uh, I kind of heard in your question, uh, potentially a, a sense of where I might be headed. And I, I don't have any real clear sense of that right now. Um, but I do feel as though in, in both of the books, I, they're kind of wrapping up books in, in some ways. My Stevenson book is kind of wrapping up a career with uh, two thirds of it being what I did and knew and one third of it being just me going wild with invention. You know, So there's one foot in the past and one foot in the freedom of retirement. Uh, and, and with the other, with the other book, um, there's so much in that book that that uh, I've drawn from my experience with my families, the one I grew up with and the one I'm lucky enough to have. Um, and it's just finding a place in in a in a piece of writing for things that have been meaningful to me and moments that have been rich. And, and uh, I can't imagine what it's going to be like for my kids to read this second book in 30 years if if they do, because uh, there's so much in there. That, that they'll remember uh, and of course you have to fit it in somebody else's life uh the, no, I don't... It's, it's true but i think the people closest to us um can see it's interesting because i feel like we draw from people around us even inherently whether we intend to or not yeah and that people can then see parts of themselves in the characters or parts of difficulties we've had or great things we've had yeah. that we celebrate in the writing that we're doing yeah. right Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's great. I mean, I, you know, my, when my children read parts of my book, I say children and I don't know if it's similar for you, but mine are in their twenties, like late twenties. So not really kids, but um, I think, you know, they see parts of things. They ask me questions like, Hey, is this based on this thing? And I'm like, yep, I'm surprised you remember that, but yes, that's what that was. Yeah. I'm just curious because now, cause you kind of hinted, towards retirement and things like that is whether or not you look to as a writer gain an audience and not like mm. I need people to buy my books but I start having stories to which your audience follows you know what I mean sure. like um all the experience you have with the camp you're talking about and things like that just writing something that also brings that that lightness and fun to it yeah yeah, I mean, I, I I certainly think about an audience, and it's a little different than the audience I write for here. Uh, <laughs> I, I was reading a few of the excerpts from Pocket Full of Posies to our staff at the staff campfire before the season started, and the current director, who's a wonderful man in his 30s, uh, late 30s, 
came up to me afterwards and said, Tom, are you, uh, what, what parts are you planning to read to the boys when they get here? And I said, Kenny, none of, none of them. Uh, and he was totally relieved. But he, he asked it so wonderfully, what, what are you planning as opposed to you're damn well not going to read any of that crap. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, a different audience. But um, I, there are a couple of things I guess I would answer. I, I've been analyzing things my whole life. And, and the more I've gotten to be a writer, the more I've come to appreciate what I was kind of overlooking because I was analyzing, you know, I was looking for theme and structure and so forth and forgot the, the beauty of a particular description or an emotional moment well, well expressed. Um, and, and I, and I feel like I want to have an audience, not just for, for my in front of class lectures, but also for the thing that I've learned to do a little bit, the way all of these artifacts that we were looking at were, were done. Um, and I, heavens, I, I, I wish Seeking Hyde had sold better. I, I didn't publicize it very well. This time I've actually hired a wonderful publicist and she's got me on social media. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm on even on TikTok, but Facebook I'd never done. And um, I'd never done um, Instagram and certainly never TikTok. And, and I wouldn't be doing that if I didn't want to, to sort of reach a number of people. And, and I'd love to have somebody decide to turn the book into a into a movie i've already got a cast in my head pretty much so yeah i i but it you know honestly it feels erica kind of like a swan song i don't i don't feel like i'm looking for an audience that's going to be coming to my concerts for 50 years like taylor swift i feel like you know maybe i'm i'm one of the one of the remaining grateful dead and i just want to get a few people to my last concerts but uh, i don't mean to sound morbid and moribund at all because i I plan to keep living a long and happy life, but um, I, I'm much more about um, just a few people seeing that there was a creative side that went along with the with the analytical guy. Uh, well, well, and I think my, you. Oh, go, ahead. Oh, go ahead, Mark. I was going to say my question would be, where does when you're writing something like the, that, where does the creative side start? And the historical academic side have to stop. Where do you where do you stop yourself? Um, well, I guess the only real experience I've had in, in that vein was was seeking hide. Um, and I think the historical stuff had to stop when when I suspect that a reader would get bored with what I was doing. Um, I at, at that particular point, I had this notion that that I could just describe the streets of Victorian London and people would be wondering and marveling that I knew, you know, what road intersected with which. And I was, I was setting it so richly in terms of topographical detail that, that I'd let the plot go. Um, and so you have, to, you have to say, well, forget about the setting and let's get a little more action. Um, and, uh, and the balancing act is, is having it still be historical. So um, I, I was having more trouble stopping the history and starting the creative than the other way around. Okay. So it's a good question. No, it's true. I just am curious because it seems to me from even what you were teaching in the analytical part and what you did with this book. So obviously, if you write using the language that we don't use anymore, and um, I feel this is true because a lot of like historical romance, I've talked about this on the show, I can't stand most historical romance. It takes, it's so long. Like, I'm not a Jane Austen fan personally because everything just takes eons to get to where it's going. And that's not where I'm at. And that's not where in general, the audience is. Um, no, I'm going to take that back. There are a lot of audience for that. There are a lot of people that love Jane Austen, right? And love mm -hmm. that whole thing. And there are many authors that emulate that writing style for their stories and stuff like that. But I'm curious because you have a unique situation that not a lot of authors have. It's you have all these historical references, right, that you could take and put into a more, um, I don't want to say modern setting, but you can make the stories prepared for the audiences that are out there today mm -hmm. that would be hungry because I think more and more people are very interested in those things. But if you go to sit down and read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, 
It's like brace yourself because getting through it is not what you're taught in current um, schools, English wise. I mean, right. You know, we, right. I, we could get into, and we're not going to on this one, have yeah, a really long debate about what we're teaching people now yeah. and stuff like that. But it's, it's definitely that dynamic is there. So if you took, for instance, the whole thing about chasing height and what you create in the detective thing and all of that stuff and go, cool, I'm going to do a series based on that, but have them jump from like a literary situation right. to a literary situation, kind of chasing the things around it. Cause like mm -hmm. a lot of people also, for instance, don't really get um, Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. Right. And me and Mark on our Airy Travels podcast, we're talking about the haunting of Hill House and what she did with the haunting, which is not as far back as these other ones we're talking about, but there's a whole thing to the way that was written as well that um, anyway, it just, it strikes me. There's a unique opportunity from your knowledge and what you already hold to turn that on. The, I'm not saying make it campy, but turn it to that sort of fictionalized view with certain characters of going through these literary situations that it's not like, oh, I went and read this book and then I wrote a book about writing that, read, reading that book. Like, right. you, you know those stories. Right. Differently. Yeah, and, it, and it, in fact, someone suggested that I, uh, that I write more stories about Stevenson and John Simmons as P.I.s and, and Lyndon. And I, you know, that, that might be attractive, but honestly, I, I think of Seeking Hyde as kind of my bridge out of, out of what I was doing into something different. Um, and, and, uh, I, I, when I think about what I might write in the future, it's all stuff that leaves that reverently and gratefully in the past. And I, I could, I can tell if my publicist is going to watch this, she's going to say, Tom, swing the conversation towards the new book. No, <laughs> so, it's fine. I was just, yeah. I was asking. No, I, I, I get mean, it. You know, yeah. and it's similar with the new book then, because it's a standalone. Is that the kind of like, what are you working on right now? Uh, I'm working on publicizing. <laughs> The new book and it's uh it's been fun i mean she's got me writing all kinds of interesting content stuff and she's hooked me up with people like you so it's been a real a real education uh i have not thought really about where i might go next uh for for some time and uh i i guess i wasn't prepared for the publicity side of things to be quite as fully engaging and and potentially exhausting uh as it is but i mean the, the two things i have potentially in hand, one would be an expansion of a short story, which is a kind of mountaineering ghost story, uh, which would be set in, uh, it's actually set during the Iranian hostage crisis. And then there's another possibility, which you'll recognize is very intimately tied into my being at a, a boys camp in New Hampshire, having run the trip program up here. I've been kicking around an idea of a, of a retired man, probably not an English professor, because I'd need to keep the, the, the stories as far away from me as I can humanly do. but uh, an older man walking the Appalachian Trail and inviting people that have been important to him in his life to be with him for certain parts of the trip. Um, uh, so that that uh, that would be something I would I would consider doing. But again, it's a kind of wrapping up thing, isn't it? it it's sort of retrospective, and it's well, it's uh, true. But if that's what speaks to you, that's what speaks to you. It goes along with your other book. Here's the thing about finding readers: the the truth about finding readers is. If they like the way you write and stuff like that, what they want to do is hit the buy button. Mm -hmm. Right after they get done with your story, the first thing they want to go is what what else does Tom Reed have? Right. And then they want to buy that. So both of those, I love both of those stories, but the second one very much goes in line with your first new story that we're mm -hmm. talking about more now. Yeah. And um, would go fit, you know, dovetail fit perfectly. And I do understand about the whole marketing publicity thing. Uh, uh, doing this podcast for something like 450 episodes now. Wow, the, that's amazing. The, num the number one thing authors say to me when I go, so what surprised you the most is the marketing. Like, because we're in a different time period and we're it, it doesn't matter how or where you got published, we're in a different time period where your readers are attached to these delightful devices. And mm. so you have to go to where your readers are now, right? Yeah. And you get seconds to get their attention. So I do have a question about your um, book. And then Mark's going to ask a question. That's what I'm saying, Mark. So come up with a question or else. Um, uh, and then we're going to jump to a break. But my question is, 
you talk about traveling in these places. Did you pick places you've traveled to? Yeah, yeah. Um, all of them have been places that, that I've been, largely with my family as well. <laughs> and to be brutally honest, I picked them all to be incredibly photogenic. So that if uh, Greta Gerwig makes the movie, as I hope she will, she'll have all these marvelous settings to, to sort of photograph things in. Um, and, you know, part of that was calculating, but but I also knew I could probably describe places in the book in a way that would ravish the reader's eye a little bit. Uh, you know, you might as well have a scenic novel as a scenic film, really. Um, so, yeah, I, I chose them because they... I've been there because they were all emotionally rich in, in one way or another. So even though I was writing a different story for different characters than my family, all of the places came charged with, with, uh, with excitement and love. And, and uh, you know, and, and it's a place you like, you can't talk about it without being excited. And, and I couldn't put my characters in a place that I love without getting excited about them, so. No, that I, I actually like that you did that because a lot of times, and I've done this myself, we all write to places that we necessarily haven't been, but it's I you can almost tell when you're reading it whether or not a person yeah. has been to the place that they're talking about. Yeah. Because if they haven't, it's a very, very different kind of situation. Like you can describe it and you can Google map it <laughs> and you can zoom in, you can do all yeah. these things, watch a bunch of YouTube videos on it. But it's very different when you're standing there because you can't feel it unless you're standing there. Yeah. Well, that's where, you know, that's where, honestly, you're tempted. If you haven't been there, you're tempted to get out your photos or your Google map or something. And, you know, you describe what might be there. And it's always hokey. It's always contrived and probably more fastidious than it is creative. So, yeah, I, it, all these places had to be places that I'd been. And the last one, incidentally, is the is the uh, Molly Pitcher rest stop uh, on the New Jersey Turnpike, where I spent a snowy evening once. So, it's that got, intriguing. You got snowed the in there. Yeah, yeah. I was driving home from uh, my parents' house in in uh, Rhode Island back to grad school at Virginia, and it just snowed like the Dickens. And I decided I'd better pull over, so I spent the night in my uh, Toyota Corolla in the parking lot. <laughs> At the Molly Pitcher. And the funny thing was that I went on to teach at Dickinson College and, and Molly Pitcher is famous through her connection with that town. Yep. Little little did I know that the snowstorm and my my uh, career would be so aligned around the that one name. So my wow. question is you've taught you've taught film, you've taught all this stuff. When you're writing. Uh, are you, you and you were already casting it in your mind and all that you've mentioned so were you writing with intent for film or were you writing just as intent for novel uh really the latter uh and i didn't think about casting it until after the fact um but i guess the the, the notion of global adventure in these wonderful sites to me kept open the possibility of film but i was i think being brutally realistic about my chances of doing that and Rather than writing a novel that might, if all the dominoes fell the right way, become a film, I wanted to write a novel that was going to be okay as a novel. Um, and then, in a sense, film be damned. But but then after the fact, my, my wife loved the, the, to do the casting stuff too. And so as we were lying in bed listening, listening to NPR and drinking coffee in the morning, she'd say, well, who do you think could play Cine? And, you know, then it's, it's just expanded from there. It's just fun to do. Um, but it was really trying to fit the actors into the characters rather than writing the characters to the actors, which which Smart. I can imagine some people doing. And I think it would make for a pretty horrid book. But who knows? Yeah, well, that's true. I mean, I think we we all get um, actors in mind when we see things. But we're going to take a quick break and then we'll talk about who you cast when we come back. OK, good. Hey listeners, you know me, Eric Lance. You're just listening to me in the podcast that you have, but guess what? I'm doing something new. Yeah, she's joining me, Mark Muncy, the author of the Erie, Florida book series in Erie, Appalachia, and we are hosting a new podcast called Erie Travels. Woo-woo, Erie Travels, which covers things like ghosts, cryptids, weird stuff, UFOs, men in black, all kinds of fun things that people talk about and I'm sure you've discussed with friends. 
Yep. And you can listen to us on your favorite podcast platform of choice or find us at eerietravels.com and join in the fun and all the spooky goodness. And of course, Mark, what do we always say? We'll see you on the other side. Okay, we're back. So I'm actually going to do something a little different because I'm going to jump to literary briefs because we would ask these questions about the cast of your thing in the literary briefs. So we're going to jump, we're going to jump, jump, jump to literary briefs. Okay, here we go. First question. What is your favorite book of all time? Oh, boy. Um, I've read some really great ones recently. Uh, I trust. I don't know if you've read that. Marvelous. Um, and uh, a Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead. But I'm going to have to go with uh, Remains of the Day, Kazuro Ishiguro, uh, which I'm just, every time I read it, I'm overwhelmed by it. Well, it is a very powerful, powerful yeah. piece. What the, about uh, your next favorite books? Oh, geez. Uh, what, I mean, no, no. Oh, my gosh. Vodka. Oh, I was like, wait a minute, Erica. My, my wow. Least... The question is least favorite book. Oh. Yeah, I, I don't, I guess I have a least favorite. I don't, I don't have a least favorite author because I tend not to read somebody more than once if I didn't like them. But, you know, I, I think it's Raise the Titanic by Clive Cussler. And <laughs> Mark likes that. I'm I, applauding, I, but uh, I'm worried that the chainsaw sounds might be a bit much. That's I, I was, I was doing a course, a freshman seminar one year at Dickinson on the Titanic. Then James Cameron's movie had just come out, and I'm one of the greatest fans of that movie, much to the embarrassment of most of the people who know me. But I, I decided I had to read everything about the Titanic that I could. And unfortunately for me, Clive Cussler's Raise the Titanic was in there, and I just remember hating it and, and remember very little about it except this one very vivid scene where this gratuitously naked woman is standing in the hangar deck of an aircraft carrier I think trying to subdue Russians with her naked breasts. And that that was sort of to me that epitomized the book. And and I I didn't it didn't ring particularly true or significant with me. So I, I, I feel sorry for the uh the ghostwriter that was hired that job. Yeah. Uh, that was one of the early Cussler ghostwriter pieces. I'm uh, sure. But yeah. uh yeah, they were given specific tasks. I I was almost a Cussler ghostwriter at one point, and it was wow. Uh, there are pages where they're like, all right, page 27, need a nude scene. Page yeah. 17, we need that. Mostly that was the executioner series of Don Pendleton. We had to do that. But uh, yeah. the Cussler had similar similar story. Yeah, I don't know why that one sticks out. I think because I was reading so much that was wonderful about the Titanic, and that just sort of stuck out as not quite so good. No arguments here. So. Yeah. All right. My question is, uh, favorite book genre to read? Favorite book genre? Uh, does literary fiction count as a book genre? Sure. Yeah, sure. I, w I, I would say so I would narrow down, but that works. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that. Um, I love dark comedy. Um, there's a little dark comedy in in Seeking High, but there's a lot of dark comedy in uh, Pocket Full of Posies. Uh, I I like I like romance in the really pared down form. I, um, with you know, with the with the sort of quest and the purpose and the suffering and all that, I, I I'm a great lover of Stevenson, and and uh, I'm about to to be a guide on a literary walking tour of Scotland. I'm I'm having everybody read um, um, Kidnapped. Oh, perfect. And, and Treasure Island, I think, is a great book too. And and that stories with that kind of feeling to them always appeal to the kid in me. And, and sometimes they're really well written, and so you can get your adult pleasure and your sort of childish aspirant pleasure out of a book like that. So yeah, I like I like classic uh, kind of adventure romances. That's my that's I guess my genre of choice. And I I taught a course on vampire fiction for several classes, and, and okay, that so was fun. What's your favorite vampire book. Pardon? Favorite vampire book. Uh, probably Dracula, just because it's so full of stuff. Uh, man, you could. You could get at any any idea you wanted to get at through that that book. It says so much about about humanity and men and women and culture and repressiveness and and uh, yeah, it's 
And he, he was one of those people who certainly wrote about places he'd never been. And, and that's a little clunky at times, but it's still a great book, I think. Yeah. Let's cast this movie. All right. Okay. Well, um, the the main characters are actually Brian and, and uh, Grace, and they are twins in their 40s. And uh, my brother-in-law um, founded with his wife the Mountain School of Milton Academy, and uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal was, was one of his students. So to get Jake and Maggie as brother and sister into those two parts would be terrific, I think. Um, I, I wrote um, Cindy, the, the matriarch, uh, as a kind of Joni Mitchell character. She went to Woodstock and, and that's where she, she, something happens with her and to her there that sort of works through the rest of the plot in a significant way. But I sort of imagine her always looking like Joni Mitchell. She goes to Dartmouth with her husband when he gets a job and he's the Shelley guy, the Percy Shelley guy and with his Joni Mitchell wife. But I think Sissy Spacek would be incredible for that, for that part. Um, wow. She's uh, she, she, in the in the novel. She's dying at seventy, and and she's got that. Uh, you can look at her face, and you can see the richness of her experience there, with a behind a scrim of wit and 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 irreverence. And I think Sissy would be great at that. There's a there's a young, wild young woman who's a, a self-professed um, uh, socialist, feminist, nihilist, who I think Jenny Ortega would be terrific as she's the star of Wednesday and she's really good. Oh yeah. Um, I think uh, I, I know John Bernthal and uh, I think he could play the, the wife or the husband of Grace. Um, and eventually I may send him the, the book and he'll probably say, it's a wonderful book time, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I think he could do that. Uh, but it's fun, you, you sort of think about people plugging into these various things. So that's a start. And, and and if I could get the Jill and Halls, and I would honestly, they should love doing something like this, right? They're brother and sister, and here's a role that would be perfect for them to be comedic and poignant and all that. So maybe they'll watch your show and they'll contact you and get my contact information. Hey, that would be fantastic if they. I'd love the Jill and Halls to be yeah, watching our show. That would be amazing, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, that would be fantastic. Um. Okay, so, and you mentioned a director. You have a director? Yeah, Greta Gerwig, uh, who did Little Women. Um, she's she's a terrific actor, and she's also a marvelous director. Um, and she she uh, did Lady Bird as well. Um, she's She's got this incredibly light directorial touch um, where she just gets her actors to, to sort of... Um, emote in this effortless authentic way um i just think the world of her work um but yeah that would be that would be fun um anyway cool. I, I don't think christopher nolan is the guy for it so he's, <laughs> he's busy with oppenheimer anyway yeah. that's that's true but yeah. i i could see that i mean different different kind of movie yep. okay as a um, professor of film what is your guilty pleasure film my guilty pleasure film. Uh, I mean, everybody's is Love Actually. I think. Um, okay. I mean, maybe maybe I'm wrong with that, but but we love that. Uh, I would say the Titanic is a kind of guilty pleasure film as well, and my family watches it every New Year's, uh, uh, New Year's Eve to keep us up until until the the ball falls. It started in New Zealand when we were living there in in 2001, and I my kids were young and we had to keep them awake, so. And that's a guilty pleasure in a sense, because everybody knows it's a blockbuster and I, the people don't necessarily respect it all that much. But the more you know about the Titanic and that history, the more Cameron's script and, and the way that's filmed is just a labor of love. I mean, it's like a gothic cathedral of a film in terms of the historical actualities. Um, but but yeah, if I tell people that one of my favorite films is, is Titanic, they sort of smile politely and you know, <laughs> move on to the next person. Well, I think it's kind of interesting because you mentioned Loved Actually, which is is one of my favorite. I've watched that anytime it's on. And, you know, of course, during the holidays, you have to watch it. But that's not a film anyone would ever go this award winning, breathtaking masterpiece. 
I think a lot of stuff like that is just so overlooked because of its simplicity in delivering entertainment that, you know, it doesn't have something that's necessarily shocking or whatever to it. It just is there and you have amazing actors and you get embroiled in the the situation. And I think Titanic is a very similar thing. Yes, it's a very beautiful, you know, epic masterpiece of a film, which he does right um james cameron yeah uh known for but i think that there's a lot to it that um i could see why it would be a favorite because it does have a lot of things and especially if you have a history buff i mean he brought something that a lot of people knew was a thing but not and he found a story to tell with it that didn't take away from the entire history of the um the sinking of that particular ship for lack of a better way of saying it. yeah and it's a story about this reciprocal rescue because rose obviously releases jack from that handcuff thing and and there's the ship singing and he rescues her from that awful marriage to cal you know yeah. so it's it's uh it's a little bit like pretty woman in that you know people rescuing somebody right back uh and i i honestly like anything that's about the reciprocality of, of men and women or or partners you know where they do for each other uh, uh appeals to me uh, as in this kind of egalitarian spiritual way um so yeah i i that part of of titanic he did find a wonderful story there and it's also a story which which reconciles the the classes because remember that historically the all the poor people were thought to have been probably were locked down below and it's only the rich people that got off and so that that historical event became this this center of this terrible debate about social injustice. Uh, and at the end of that film, a, a aristocratic woman and a and a working class kid fall in love, and and it's just this moment of historical reconciliation. So, kind of beautiful, but nobody talks about that much. Anyway, very cool, very cool. Okay, what about? Um... So one of the things you mentioned was the Appalachian Trail. Have you walked the Appalachian Trail? Uh, I walked almost all the miles in New Hampshire, um, which amounts to maybe 120 or something. Some of the best miles on the on the trail. I did a lot in Virginia, but that's about it. I, I've not I've hiked sections, but not even become a a segment hiker. Um, but we've done a lot of long walks. And when we were in New Zealand, we did the root burn, we did the uh, Milford track, we did the Queen Charlotte. Um, and my wife and I have done a lot of walks in England, the Cotswold way. And we walked from Oxford to Bath the other year. And we're going to Scotland to do this, the space side way from uh, Inverness down to Perth. And honestly, that I think the happiest I, I can be is is walking with my wife on this uh, kind of wilderness trail and you stop and have lunch at a pub and then you go to your charming little inn or B&B and you find a nice place for dinner. It's just, life is about getting from point A to point B and and having nice conversation and beautiful sights and good meals along the way. It's just, I've told her when I can't walk anymore, she's got to shoot me. <laughs> so maybe that's that's the the part of the book that will come to, to pass. And, Suddenly you're writing a cozy mystery. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I, I we do love walking, and and I actually thought about doing the AT. Um, that's where that idea for a book came from. But I've just I couldn't I couldn't bring myself to do it. It'd be too psychologically taxing to set out on that kind of long journey. That is an endeavor. So, uh, as the author of Erie Appalachia, I understand. So, yeah, that was we didn't we didn't walk the whole thing. We just drove to. In very very many points on it so yeah i i people come through here literally the trail goes right over our land up here and and i walk almost every day by people coming out of one woods on one side of the road and going to the other and i always talk to them and and it's uh they're always very realistic about how challenging it's been but th- they're all happy to have done it the ones that aren't happy to have done it go they'll get this far so no no they, they'll stop you know the carolinas or tennessee yeah yeah Yep, definitely. Unless they're coming the other way down. <laughs> right. That's so very true. Very true. Okay. What about if you could be any mythological or fantastical creature, what would you be and why? Yeah, I I 
when I was watching um, a previous episode, somebody said the, what I was going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. That I would think about being a centaur. And the reason for that is I've never had a buff upper body. And I think centaurs all have that. And I, I would go for that just to see what it's like. And also the speed of foot. I would love to be able to run over 20 miles an hour. So I think a centaur would would be good. And then there's that. I could see that with the amount of walking you do, you cover a yeah. much greater distances. Yeah. And then I could spend more time writing because I'd still have my hands, right? Yeah. And yeah. then there's that commercial, the progressive insurance commercial with the motor, you know, the guy yeah, that's yeah, got the, a the motorcycle. motorcycle are, yeah. <laughs> That'd be cool. That'd be fun. That'd I'd be fun. love to. I always wondered how he got his kickstand down. Exactly. <laughs> He's probably going to help her. No, but I'd love to cross the country on a, as a motor. That would be sort of fun. That'd be fun. Yeah. That'd be fun. Okay, so you can travel anywhere in space and time. Mm. Uh, who do you meet besides Robert Louis Stevenson? Oh boy, um, be fun to meet the guy who invented the wheel. Uh, there you go. That would be fun. I, I it would you know, be a pro- <laughs> Yeah, it would probably be a literary guy. Um, I think it'd be fun to meet Jeffrey Chaucer. Um, I don't. I don't know any authors who are wiser than he in a, in a very down to earth kind of way. He was a real iconoclast too. And, and I think he, uh, he invented in a lot of ways the, the fiction of implication. Yeah. The, the Canterbury Tales, the general prologue of the Canterbury Tales is so suggestive. Uh, and you build your sense of characters just on the slightest hints, which of course he's giving you, but you feel like you're gleaning them yourself. And then when you hear him talking, every single tale becomes a really good story by somebody you've been in the creative writing workshop with because you've already met him in the general prologue right so you know him and then you see him cranking out this amazing stuff and and you say to yourself geez they're really smart and look at that person working out this neurosis which is really disturbing the class uh he's you know brilliant brilliant and i could probably just converse with him i i think i could communicate in Some middle, ang- old, in old middle old english language. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that would be fun. Um, don't worry, Erica. We're not going to shift into medieval English for the rest no, of the time. No, don't I worry. hope not, because you will lose listeners. Yeah, <laughs> no. but they should all look at Chaucer. Um, yeah. he, he's worth the look, anyway. At least the Miller's Tale. Uh, yeah. I'm a fan of the Miller's Tale. It's fun. It's just fun. <laughs> so. You know, I, I there's another. I, one of the questions, and I don't mean to be asking your questions of myself. No, you but can ask our questions. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, one of your, I'll walk out and shut up the chainsaws. One of your great questions was what what uh, literary world, what author's world would you enter into? Um, and I think it'd be really fun to, to uh, well, what, one I would love to go into, and it's in line with my romance thing, would be Patrick O'Brien's world, you know, the Napoleonic Wars and and uh, Jack Aubrey and Stephen Maturin. But I think Dickens' world would also be really fun to go back to. Oh. And, you know, meet all Mr. Magwitch and, you know, all the all the strange characters. And the cool thing is that, do you guys know Sarah Waters, um, uh, Fingersmith and uh, Tipping the Velvet? Uh, oh, she, yes. she writes books about that period and she just recreates Dickens' London with all of these contemporary themes. So that it kind of lets you do it. But um, if you had enough to eat and drink, it would be fun to go back and live in Dickens, London for a while, I would think. Yeah, definitely. I would say food would be the main priority there. Yeah. yeah. Sanitation, too, a little bit. So. Yeah, absolutely. We want Only to stay away from color. Yeah, just, just, just a touch. Just a touch. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. What was I going to ask? Oh, yeah. Um, favorite weird, weird food combination. Weird food. Um, you know, th- there's something which I tried again just this year after having not tried it for about 50 years. And it was something my mother loved that was peanut butter and bacon sandwiches. All you, right. You toast some wheat toast and you slather on peanut butter, the chunky kind, these days, low, low sugar, and, and you throw bacon in there and it's absolutely delicious. Um, but nothing I'm ever going to find in a restaurant menu, I don't think. And then you do the Elvis and add a little bit of marshmallow on it, and you're good. No, no, <laughs> I've never, I've never liked marshmallows, which will seem, you know, like heresy because I, I'm involved in a camp. You know, yeah. you think, yeah, 
Don't you think I'd eat s'mores every day of my life, but I just don't like them. I think right. they're they're such pure sugar that that even a sugar lover in so me. So does your camp have an urban legend as we have to plug our eerie travels here? Uh it does. It's got a legend of of the one-armed brakeman. Um and, and the, the story behind that is that camp boys were once traveling to camp on a train from Chicago. This is in the old days where there were escorted trips. And this kid was screwing around with the brakes and, and the train ground to a halt. And in the process, the brakeman lost his arm. And so he was reputed to live in the hills above the camp and, and stalk around the woods. Uh, those weren't, that weren't being cut down by chainsaws at the time, but stalk around the woods, looking for boys sort of wandering aimlessly at night and then terrorizing them. So there was that. But honestly, Mark, we're, we're doing our best to suppress that legend because okay yeah eight, no we won't no, don't share this with anybody then from the, the eight-year-olds have a hard time making it to the bathroom which is across the field from where their cabins are if they're oh. thinking they're going to be snatched and eaten yeah yeah no no jason Voorhees stories for them so. no no not at all it's a goosebumps level guys don't worry yeah yeah goosebumps level what they want to do is they just want to tickle you yeah <laughs> well yeah yeah it's just, you know, and, and we're frustrating their instincts. And if they ever did anything bad, it's just because we weren't letting them tickle us enough, right? Right. Yeah, there we go. There we go. That's there. We brought it. Okay. Well, let's do shameless self-promotion time, Tom. Where, okay. where should people look for your book that you want to promote and you? Okay. I mean, I have a website, thomasreadauthor.com with a www in front of it, but uh, Thomas Reed, R-E-E-D. Um, I'm going to have to look at my card here. I'm on Facebook at Tom Reed Jr., Tom Reed JR35. Uh, I'm on Instagram at Tom Reed JR35. And I'm on TikTok uh, as Tom Reed35. Uh, and my book's available for pre order on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all this, the various uh, independent uh, sites. And I would encourage people to, to get it at their local bookstore because I believe in independent bookshops. I agree completely. I love that. Thank you so much for being on this podcast with us. It was a real pleasure. I was looking forward to it and it's delivered in spades. So hey. I'm, I'm delighted. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, guys, this has been Drinking With Authors. I have been your host, Erica Lance. My co-host has been the always haunting Mark Muncy from Erie Travels. And our guest today has been Tom Reed. And we will see you. Oh, don't forget to like, subscribe, review, comment. Yes, right. I always forget it at the end because, you know, screwdrivers. Follow and, our guests uh, and, and pre-order his book. Yes. Yeah, sure. Yes. And we will see you next time. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome.